So I'm going to talk about um, computational microbiology of the E. coli cell envelope and, and really describe the work that we've been doing in my group for the last sort of 13 or 14 years where we've been trying to work with structural biologists and microbiologists to build up a picture of the um, not only the structure but really the structure and dynamics um, that take place within the um, cell envelope of gram-negative bacteria with an initial focus on E. coli. But before, before going any further, I thought it would be useful just to have a very quick um, biology lesson in terms of just discussing what the, um, the architecture of the cell envelope looks like. So as many of you will know, the cell envelope of gram-negative bacteria is made up of three different um, compartments. The one, the compartment that faces the outside world, so the outermost compartment, is the outer membrane. And this is made up, this is a lipid bilayer, as, um, as, as all biological membranes are. The outer leaflet of this um, outer membrane, so the part that really does face the outside world, is composed of a molecule called lipopolysaccharide. So this is, this molecule has a lipid component, it has between four to six hydrocarbon tails, uh, then it's con connected by head groups, some of which are phosphorylated. On top of that, there are many layers of sugars building up to what's known as the O antigen, which is many, many layers of sugars. And again, some of these sugars are phosphorylated and some are not. The inner leaflet, in contrast, is composed of the simpler phospholipid molecules. Embedded within the membrane, there's a whole bunch of different proteins, so it's fairly crowded with proteins, but all of these proteins, um, other than I think one, um, have a beta barrel architecture. So that's the outer membrane. On the other side, so that facing the, um, the cell, we have the inner membrane. The inner membrane has got phospholipids in both leaflets, and the proteins that are embedded within this membrane have a helical architecture. So it can be a single helix or a whole bunch of helices connected up by loops. Now, in between the two membranes, so we can think about them, if we think of it as a sandwich arrangement, you can think of the two membranes as the bread. The filling within that sandwich is an aqueous region called the periplasm. And this contains the cell wall. The cell wall is, um, is otherwise known as peptidoglycan. It's a polymer of sugars and peptides. Again, this region, the periplasm, is also pretty jam-packed full of proteins, so soluble proteins because it's aqueous. Now, over the last um, years, well, ever since I set up my group at Southampton, we've been interested in modeling the, um, the E. coli cell envelope at the atomistic level of detail, in other words, where we include every single atom explicitly, and also at a more coarse grain level of detail, where we throw away some of the um, atomistic detail in order to enable much um, access longer timescales. And you can see in this table on the first, um, in the first, um, or, or sorry, the way it's written, the second column there from the left, you can see the LPS molecule represented with all its heavy atoms shown in the atomistic model and then beneath it, the coarse grain counterparts. So you can see that the overall shape is about the same and we retain the chemical details, so hydrophobicity, polarity, charges, but you've got fewer particles. And what I'd like to talk about um, in the time I have left is the journey that we've gone on and where we've engaged with structural biologists and the sort of the coming together of simulation and computational approaches with structural biology and the information that can yield. We first started off by looking at um, antimicrobial peptides. And I'll be perfectly honest, these were at the time when we started doing this work and they, and they still are, they, they were a hot topic. So in that sense, it was very, um, it was an attractive target but also antimicrobial um, peptides tend to be a lot smaller than not other proteins. And so, again, it was a bit more tractable with the resources we had at the time, and we would just set the group up to take a look at these. And we started off by having a look at polymyxin B1. So this is a, an antimicrobial peptide, which is selective for gram-negative bacteria. It shows um, very little development of resistance. And it has a sort of a, a caterpillar shape. So you have a, um, a ring region, which has a charge of plus five. 
and that's so, it, so it's charged, it's polar. And then there's a, a hydrophobic tail, which in this figure is um, labeled as lip one. So it's got a lipophilic tail. Okay, and it's how it works is it lyses the cell at the inner membrane, but it has to somehow get across the outer membrane and the periplasm to get access to the inner membrane. And the really interesting thing is it's highly active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now Pseudomonas aeruginosa does not have proteins in the outer membrane which have got pores big enough for polymyxin to get through in its folded form. And so you can't, it's difficult to say, well, actually it gets, it gets across the outer membrane by going through proteins because the proteins aren't big enough or the pores within them aren't big enough. So it, chances are it's getting across the outer membrane by direct action on the membrane, but no one really knows how. So we thought we'd take a look at this by doing some simulations. We started off by having a look at, first of all, the inner membrane where the um, cell lysis takes place because it's simpler. You'll recall I said the inner membrane is composed of phospholipids on both sides. So we made a model of the, um, the membrane and we took seven polymyxin um, molecules. We just placed them on top of the membrane, um, not quite touching it in, in the water region. There's water and ions in the system. I've just removed them here from the pictures for clarity. And we run the simulation and we can see, and again, I've removed the six other polymyxins here. So you're just seeing one. And what you can see is that within about 300 nanoseconds, what we're seeing is um, the tails of the um, polymyxin. You can just see there going into the membrane. Can you see that? It's just inserting into the membrane. And all seven polymyxins did the same thing. Okay, the tails went in and you can extrapolate easily from there that when all the tails go in, um, they're creating a weak region or a defect in the membrane. And that could be the mechanism via which cell lysis occurs, that eventually you'd get a hole in the membrane and the contents of the cell would be able to get out. So that all agreed with what was, um, what was considered to be the case um, from experimental studies. But again, what happens to the outer membrane? How does it get across? So we took a similar approach. We now ran microsecond long simulations of this system. And the reason for that is LPS diffuses 10 times slower than phospholipids. So we knew we had to run these simulations out for a lot longer. So we set the simulations up in the same way. We put the polymyxins above the membrane and you'll recall I said polymyxin has a charge of plus five. Well, I've highlighted in the diagram there four of the um, five positive moieties on polymyxin. Now, the key thing is that this LPS molecule, remember I said it has whole lot, lots and lots of sugars and some of the sugars are phosphorylated. Well, the phosphate groups obviously have negative charges on them. The um, sugars also have hydroxyl groups okay so that you've got these chances for hydrogen bonding and negative moieties and i've just highlighted here the coming together of positive with negative and so you'd expect strong electrostatic interactions and you can see from this movie that indeed that's what happens right you can see here these blue positively charged moieties latch on to the red negatively charged moieties and just stick there they find their equilibrium positions and then they don't move. And furthermore, can you see that the cyan colored lipid tails are moving a lot slower than the magenta colored ones? The magenta colored ones are phospholipids in the inner leaflet. The, the cyan ones are the LPS. They're just not moving very fast. So now we have a problem, right? We know the polymyxin must get through the outer membrane, but the problem is the LPS in the outer membrane forms multiple electrostatic interactions with polymyxin B1. And that really anchors it in place. And then on top of that, LPS is moving really slowly. And so you get this kind of effect, this kind of clamping down effect. The polymyxin is clamping onto the outer membrane and sticking there. And so with molecular dynamic simulations, we're restricted to, you know, at the most microseconds of simulations, maybe milliseconds, the really state-of-the-art simulations. And that's just not going to be enough to see anything here. And so to observe biologically 
interesting phenomena, we need extended timescales and more realistic systems. So at the time, these were, these were sort of state-of-the-art simulations in 2015, but they still weren't showing us biologically interesting phenomena because of this timescale limitation. So this got us thinking, really, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do simulations of biological relevance? We've already said that we need longer timescales, and so we probably need coarse grain models, and, and I'll come on to that later. But actually, it really got us thinking, to observe relevant phenomena, surely we also need more sophisticated models that represent the in vivo scenario a bit better. We know there's biological biochemical heterogeneity within the system and crowding. There's loads of proteins, right? There's not just one. There's not just one type of antibiotic in there. There's lots of, we know these membranes, we know the periplasm, they're jam-packed full of proteins and lots of other molecules as well. There's all sorts of osmolites in there. And so what we're doing now is we're setting up these simulations where we, we are putting that crowding in. We're putting in that heterogeneity, and I'm just going. And we've got these atomistic systems, which are over one million atoms big at the moment, and we've got them running out at the moment for microseconds of simulation. And I just want to describe a bit of the journey in the, in the time I have left that we've taken to get to this point, and how we build these complex simulations. Sorry, these complex systems. So we first started off by taking a look at this protein um, on A, which is in the outer membrane. It's known to be um, it's, it's known to bind the um, cell wall. It has two components. It's got a transmembrane region, which you can see in the grey on the um, left hand side. This sits in the membrane, and then it has a soluble C-terminal domain and a long flexible linker. And actually recently, um, Carol Robinson's group in, in Oxford have also reported from their mass spec studies that they, they see this protein existing as a dimer. Luckily for us, there's an X-ray structure is available of the C-terminal domain of the protein bound to a small portion of the cell wall. So we took this part, the C-terminal domain, with the cell wall bound, but it was only a tiny portion of the cell wall, the bits shown in the um, orangey colored box, so we built in the two sugars that were left that were needed to build one monomeric unit of peptidoglycan, and we ran some simulations. From the crystal structure, two salt bridges were identified that, that, were, that were part of the interaction between the protein and the cell wall. So one involving arginine-286 and one involving aspartate-271. Encouragingly, when we ran our simulations, you can see at the bottom there, they, um, the, um, the plot is just showing the distance between the, um, the amino acid of interest and the, the peptidoglycan. You can see that in our simulations, these salt bridges were retained. And so we were confident that the protein peptidoglycan, albeit just one monomer at this point, the, the model we had was, um, was accurate. It was, it was retaining these important salt bridges that had been identified by X-ray crystallography. Okay, so then we thought we'd go one step further now by, we know in, in, in vivo peptidoglycan is a huge cell wall that covers the entire um, cell. So it, it, in order to build a model that's representative of that, we built a, a big mesh of peptidoglycan and we bound it to itself on both on, 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 in, um, across the X and the um, Y dimension. So we have a um, 2D continuous model of the cell wall. And we set up simulations where we took this protein on pay in the membrane and we placed it at 90 angstroms from the cell wall. We estimated 90 angstrom based on tomography data. And we ran our simulations. Remember, it's known that the C-terminal domain of OMPE will bind to the cell wall. Unfortunately, we didn't see anything happen. We didn't see any interactions between the two at all, which was initially puzzling. And, and this is the key for us when it comes to simulations in biology. The key is getting the details right. It was at that point my postdoc pointed out that we did not have in this model um, bronze lipoprotein. This protein is the most abundant protein in E. coli. It's covalently bound to the cell wall at one side and anchored into the membrane on the other side. Once we put this protein in, you can see it here in green, 
amazingly, what happened was the protein kinked a little bit, it tilted a little bit. This led to a reduction in the gap between the cell wall and the membrane by about 20 angstroms. And this, seemed, this was enough for the C-terminal domain of OMPE to sense the protein and fall down. The linker extended and the C-terminal domain fell on top of the cell wall and it picked out the same salt bridges that we had seen previously, along with a few others. And so again, spontaneously from the simulations, once we got the biological details right, we were able to pick out the binding mode of the protein with the cell wall. So this gave us confidence that we've got the membrane and the cell wall part right. We then moved on to, and I'll, 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 in the interests of time, hurry up this part somewhat. We then decided to build in um, the inner membrane and proteins which bind to the cell wall from that side. And here we, took, we were collaborating with um, Colin Cleantus' group in Oxford, where they built a, a model in collaboration with Phil Stansfeld's group of the Tol R protein, which is known to bind to um, the cell wall from the inner membrane side. So we put this protein in, and interestingly, what we did is we didn't have it binding. We didn't have the protein quite binding to the cell wall. We left it just a bit short. And as we ran the simulations, we saw the protein bind to the cell wall. So we were able to elucidate the mechanism by which it binds. We saw the termini of the protein, this protein's a dimer, kind of almost like arms, we saw them reach up, grab hold of the cell wall, as you can see in the middle diagram, a, a, a figure at 10 nanoseconds. And it sort of grabbed onto the cell wall and then lifted the rest of the protein up so it could form its full complement of interactions. So at the end of the simulation, by 200 nanoseconds, we had a really nice stable system of this protein bound to the cell wall. So the crystallography can tell us something about the structure of the protein, but it won't give us details of how the binding process takes place. But working together, the simulations can provide that information. I'm just going to finish off with um, some slides on how we're now beginning to move towards microbiology. As I mentioned earlier, there's not just proteins in these systems. There's lots of other molecules too. So for example, the molecules shown in this um, radial distribution plot. So we've got ions, there's urea, putrescine, trellos, these osmoregulated periplasmic sugars. There's all sorts of molecules that are in there. So we're building models now where we're putting in lots of proteins, putting in lots and lots of um, these molecules, getting the fr uh, crowded volume fractions right. Whoops, sorry, if I just go back here. Um, and you can see in the, in, in the movie that, and we now put in the, go back and put in our favorite antibiotic. And you can see from the movie that we can see how the antibiotic behaves in this crowded system. You can see sometimes it's attaching to the cell wall immediately. Sometimes it's getting stuck between the protein. And this is representative of what, likely representative of what happens in real life. What doesn't happen in real life is you have a nice clean system like a chemistry laboratory where you have one protein, you have a membrane and you have the cell wall. It's jam packed full of stuff. And this is what we're beginning to explore now. And we're beginning to generate new hypotheses. So for example, in our simulations, we've seen that polymyxin can bind inside a lipopeptide um, carrying protein called LOL-A. And so we can hypothesize that this might be one of the ways through which um, the polymyxin, the antibiotic, gets across the cell wall. And to the best of our knowledge, this has not been hypothesized in the past, but we've seen it from these new crowded simulations. And I guess, you know, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. So um, this, this hypothesis is now being tested by Ian Henderson and his group in Brisbane. And my final slide, just to finish off, is as I mentioned right at the start, we still have this problem of needing to access longer timescales. And so we're now beginning to work, or we have been for some time, on coarse grain models where we've been able to show with these simplified models some really interesting behavior. So, for example, where we've got in the system here, we've got two membranes, the outer membrane, inner membrane, separated by an RND efflux pump from E. coli. All I want to show you here is these top-down views of both leaflets of the outer membrane. 
the inner leaflet, you can see these are, this is the movement of the lipids across the simulations. Hopefully you can see that the lipids are moving pretty much at random, okay? So this is here in the inner leaflet, the phospholipids. But now look what happens with the LPS. The movement is completely correlated, right? So when you have two leaflets of the same membrane, the movement of the lipids is very, very different. Again, not something we can get from structural biology, but something in which we can work with structural biologists to take their structures, embed them in these membranes and have a look at what's happening. And we're now working again with Colin Cleantus and Carol Robinson on looking at much larger systems where again we're looking at patterns of protein lipid interactions and the key is in realistic membrane lipids and realistic crowding levels. So as a summary and outlook we're working towards developing a virtual bacterial cell envelope. I won't go into this in the interest of time in too much detail I have presented some areas where we've had some success, but I also want to point out that sampling of LPS is still a problem for us. There's still areas that improvement is needed, so we need some way of accessing longer timescales. And these are areas we're working on now so that the computation can match up with the experiments in timescales as, as well as, you know, we've got the crowding right, we've got exactly the same molecules in there that the experimental guys have. What we still don't have is the timescales they have. So that's something we're working on now. And I'd just like to finish off by thanking members of my group, various collaborators, sources of funding, and also sources of computing resource, without which, of course, we can do none of this work. And I'd like to thank you um, for your attention. <laughs>